everyone, Kaichin Kumba here, and uh, yeah, uh, hey, you about done? I need more freaking bows! Yeah, sorry guys, uh, with the holiday season right around the corner, we've been trying to get a lot of stuff done, and with Connell Delete being last week in Chicago, trying to get the next video, it's been really nuts. But, there is something I gotta talk about when it comes to Breath of the Wild's newest DLC, Ballad of the Champions. I absolutely cannot let this one slip away. And you know, I really don't know whether I classify it as a standard game exchange video or a witch ninja video. Uh, witch exchange, game ninja, whatever. Breath of the Wild, Ballad of the Dirt Bike. Aki and I streamed a large part of this DLC over on my Twitch, which led to some mind-melting moments like this. Oh. Wait! <laughs> Are you serious? Are you serious? I could have just done that? But right from the get-go, all the way through to the end, there was about half a dozen things that set off my cultural analysis alone. One thing though, there's gonna be massive spoilers for this DLC, so if you haven't played it yet, you've been warned. So, god, like, how many videos have I done for this game in Japanese culture now? Like, four? Five? Yeah, let's just tack on a sixth one, because Ballad of the Champions just blew my freaking brains out culturally. And it all started at the very beginning. When you first start this five-hour runaround, you're given a very special weapon to undergo your first trial. The one-hit obliterator. Yeah, I was expecting something like a hammer, but instead we got a hand trident. But no sooner had I insulted my weapon, it drained my hearts down to freaking one quarter of one. So apparently here the shtick is that you can one-shot anything in this trial, but anything can one-shot you. Granted, I was pretty shook from how extreme this game had gotten, but I was even more shook at the obliterator itself, because one look at this thing and I was like, Shide. Okay, see those four little strips of zigzaggy paper? I bet you've seen those before, especially if you're familiar with Shinto. These strips are what are known as Shide, or vertical papers, and they're common use symbols of purification. Most of the time, you'll see them tied to Shime Nawa, or enclosing rope, which not only protect a particular site from evil spirits, but they're also used to designate Yorishiro, basically people, places, or things that are capable of being dwelling places for Kami. But in Breath of the Wild, you have these Shide on a giant, four-pronged, I don't know, mace? You smack evil baddies with it and they die instantly. That's the rhyme and reason we gotta work with here. But for as out of left field as that might sound, there might actually be a super simple cultural inspiration behind it. See, Shide are used for far more than Shime Nawa. In fact, one of the most popular uses of Shide comes from a very special and often used tool of Shinto priests called the Gohei, a wooden one that would have two or more of these Shide streamers attached to it. Priests and priestesses would wave the Gohei to and fro with sharp precision as an act of purification, and this act could purify anything really, people, objects, groundbreaking for buildings, journal locations, but no matter what the Gohei is being used for, the result is always the same, the exorcism of evil and negative energies. So basically what we have is a one-handed shaft ribboned in Shide streamers that has the ability to obliterate negative energies when swung, right? Well, isn't that exactly what the one-hit obliterator does? And is? Again, you have a one-handed shaft, granted it's got four prongs, but still, ribboned in Shide and can one-shot any monster you come across when you swing at it. And when Hyrulean monsters die, they decompose and explode into dark clouds of energy. So how could the obliterator not be a Gohei? The other big thing I gotta talk about from the Battle of the Champions DLC is the final, final boss. So again, spoilers ahead if you need to duck out now. When you finally wrap up the Clockwork Nightmare, that's the new dungeon, you're not greeted by a giant monster or another perversion of Ganon Blight, but instead, another one of the Sheikah monks. Yada yada, the same congratulations are given, but unlike every other monk who's been basically self-mummified, more on that in another video, this monk known as Maz Koshia comes to life and attacks you. How, you may ask? Like a freaking ninja! This guy is a complete amalgamation of every ninja trick we've seen between the Yika clan and the Sheikah clan, further illustrating how the two used to be one and the same a hundred years ago. This shinobi monk pulls out an ancient blade backwards and just goes to town on you, teleporting, charging, and swinging, and shadow stabbing, just like the Yiga. But that's not all, because he also has Thunderblight Ganon's super speed attacks, because, you know, that's fun. He also utilizes that speed to just straight up dodge attacks, too. Do you Hayabusa be damned, this 100 year old mummy is the biggest shinobi badass in gaming. Now granted, I've already made mention in two other videos how both the Yiga and the Shika clans utilize actual ninja culture and techniques, but Maz Koshia takes that one step further. According to this fight, a cutscene drops as you watch Maz hover back in the air. 
I'm thinking, all right, phase two, then he Bushin no Jutsu'd me. Okay, okay, okay. To clarify, the Bushin no Jutsu, for those of you who don't regularly watch Witch Ninja, is an actual real life technique that fools the ninja's target into thinking that there's more than one of them. This is done so either by moving so fast it looks like there's more than one ninja, or the ninja is joined by others wearing the exact same clothing, thus duping their enemy into thinking they're multiple of the same person. In this case, it seems obvious that Maz is creating mirrored images of himself, but considering how fast he moves and how disoriented I was trying to fight him, his speed alone was already giving me enough trouble trying to figure out who the real boss actually was. Finally, in the third phase, Maz brings his hands together and grows to a massive size, wherein he just stomps the crap out of Link. Now, I've seen this before in other games that use Ninja, specifically Final Fantasy XIV, which did the exact same thing during the Ninja questline for the Stormblood expansion. In fact, any fan of Naruto will recognize this technique right away, the Baika no Jutsu, or Double Conversion Technique. Basically, the ninja uses their key to rapidly expand their bodies, becoming huge for a limited amount of time. I scoured, guys. I scoured like crazy trying to find a real-life equivalent to this technique. I mean, if I can find this ninja jutsu in all these different games and anime, surely there's got to be some kind of origin somewhere in real life. But nothing. I'll keep digging around on this one, but the cultural origin of this jutsu, real or not, might already be lost to time. But there was one theme I noticed while fighting Maz Koshia, and that's every single time he did something supernatural or changed phases, he brought his hands together in a very, very specific way. This gesture is actually one of the kuji in nine separate hand gestures ninjas use for meditation purposes. And in the case of Maz, it was Zai. In fiction, these gestures acted as a gateway to special key techniques or magics that ninja would use. And while real-life ninja couldn't breathe fire, multiply, teleport, or any of the other fantastic tricks that storybooks tell, the Kuji-in practice in meditation had almost supernatural effects on the body. A study by one Dr. Teruhiso Komori at Mie University showed that subjects who utilized the Kuji-in postures while utilizing breathing techniques would significantly affect their brainwaves into a more relaxed state, even when faced with high-stress situations. So while these gestures can't make a ninja grow, create copies of itself, or summon giant iron balls, it can manipulate the body and mind into almost supernatural states of comfort and awareness. But that's all for this episode, everyone, so thanks for watching. In the meantime, if you're looking for more Breath of the Wild culture and gaming, like I said, I've made a ton of them over the year, both here and on the Game Theorist channel. But until next time, everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.